Right. So as I've said before, we'll be now talking about injection molding, which is a very important manufacturing technology, especially uh, for material uh, processing in terms of uh, plastics. But before we do so, uh, let's cover some key points of the last lecture that are important for you uh, to know. And last lecture was basically a review lecture on uh, polymers. And we covered two classes of materials, thermoplastics and thermosets, and some of the differences between these two important classes of materials used in uh, the industry. So in terms of thermoplastics, they normally um, have uh, weak uh, straight chain bonds between uh, them. And this is what allow them uh, to be melted and reprocessed without any uh, degradation, as long as we are uh, using temperatures that are below the degradation temperature of the materials. Thermosets are quite different from this point of view, uh, as they have very strong chemical bonds between the polymeric chains, which we normally classify as cross links. And because of that, uh, we are not able to uh, separate them uh, by providing heat. What will happen if we provide heat is that uh, we will degrade these materials. Also, and again, because of these chemical strong uh, covalent cross links between the polymeric chains, normally these materials, once they have formed this three-dimensional network, uh, they're not uh, dissolved in organic solvents, but thermo thermoplastics, because of these weak links, uh, we can degrade them or we can uh, dissolve them using uh, organic solvents. Normally, uh, the melting point of thermoplastic materials is uh, lower than the degradation point. And in the case of thermosets, this degradation point is normally lower than the melting point. And that's why when we provide heat to these materials, we normally uh, degrade them, okay? And in terms of their appearance in, in the solid uh, state, the structure of thermoplastic polymers consists normally of a hard, well-organized uh, crystalline region, uh, which is normally interdispersed by these less organized um, or more randomly organized amorphous regions. And that's why normally we don't have 100% crystalline materials. We do have what we normally call as semi-crystalline materials with regions where the polymeric chains are well organized, compacted, and then interdispersed by uh, the amorphous regions where the polymeric chains, the organization of the polymeric chains is more uh, random. Thermoset polymers uh, in the solid state, in general, their structure consists of this thermosetic resin that is normally interdispersed with uh, reinforcing fibers. So these are some important differences in terms of the structure, in terms of the, the, the behavior of these thermoplastic materials that will normally dictate how we can process them and which technologies should we choose to actually transform them from raw materials into tr tradable uh, products. <clears throat> also, we've looked at two uh, categories of materials in terms of their crystalline structure. And we've said that they normally can be divided into crystalline poly polymers and amorphous polymers. And there are some important uh, differences between them. So starting with the amorphous polymers, we've said that they're normally uh, transparent, which can be uh, a, a big advantage in terms of uh, some applications of these materials. Uh, and the reason why they are usually transparent is because of their uh, structural organization. So the looser and more uh, randomly organized uh, the structure of the polymer chains allows for the transmission of light and this makes the material to appear transparent. Also because of their less organized uh, structure, they normally present uh, low percentages of, sh uh, of shrinkage. So the contraction of the materials during the solidification process is lower when compared to crystalline polymers. And also because of that, and this can be seen as a disadvantage, they present uh, low chemical resistance and uh, poor fatigue and wear uh, resistance. 
On the contrary, uh, crystalline polymers, because of this highly organized compact structure, they have a very well-defined melting points. They do not allow the lights to be transmitted and they are normally opaque. And on the downside, they normally present uh, much higher levels of shrinkage. So the contraction, the volumetric contraction of the material is normally much higher when compared to amorphous polymers. But also because of this well-organized structure, they present in general very good mechanical properties, good fatigue and wear resistance. And this is important depending on the application that you have for these uh, materials. So the other thing that we've said is that normally polymers are rarely 100% crystalline uh, because it's difficult for all of the regions or, or, or at least in all of the regions for the chains to become fully uh, aligned and compacted. So they normally present regions uh, which are crystalline, well organized, but also regions where the polymeric chains didn't have enough time to form these organized structures. Some important concepts regarding uh, these thermoplastic uh, materials is uh, the crystallinity level, which normally refers to the degree of structural order in a solid. And in generally, it's specified as a percentage of volume of the material that is crystalline. Also importantly, the glass transition temperature or TG, which is the temperature at which an amorphous solid becomes soft when we provide heat to the system or brittle when we cool down the material. And also importantly, the glass transition temperature is lower than the melting point of its crystalline form in case it has one. The melting temperature is probably the, the most uh, important or the most commonly provided uh, temperature in terms of the specification sheets of, of the material. And it's a temperature at which uh, a crystalline polymer changes uh, state from a solid uh, into a liquid at atmospheric pressure. Also, uh, importantly, the higher the um, degree of uh, crystallinity or the more regions we have with well-organized polymeric chains, the higher will be the temperature required to melt and to process these uh, materials. So in other words, the higher the crystallinity level, the higher will be the melting point of uh, the material that you're trying to process. Different from uh, thermoplastics, uh, thermosets or uh, thermosetting plastics are generally made from what we call polymeric resins. And one important characteristic of these resins is that they are capable of generating chemical crosslinks, so very strong covalent bonds between the polymeric chains. And because of that, as we've seen before, we are not able, once they are uh, fully crosslinked, we're not able to degrade them. And if we provide heat to the system when it's in this glass state or when it's fully crosslinked, if we provide heat to the system, we will degrade it. So the process by which we transform these polymeric resins that contain normally monomers, uh, photo or thermal initiators, and as we've seen in the previous lectures, we can also have other um, additives like flexibilizers. The process by which we transform this liquid resin into a solid, it's called uh, cross-slinking. And the curing reaction is a polymerization process that it's normally characterized by a chemical cross-linking uh, reactions that creates this infusible, insoluble, and highly cross-linked three-dimensional uh, network. By uh, supplying an appropriate form uh, of energy, and in this case, as we've seen in the previous lectures, that can be in the form of heat, but also can be in the form of light, normally UV light, as, for example, 
in the additive manufacturing process that we've classified as uh, VAT photopolymerization. As we do this, we initiate an exothermic uh, reaction that transforms this uh, liquid that has a low molecular weight into a three-dimensional, fully cross-linked, high molecular weight uh, polymer that in this case is fully uh, solid. But moving from this liquid resin into this fully cross-linked three-dimensional networks uh, encompasses two different stages. And these stages are normally classified as gelation and vitrification. And there are some important considerations that we need to remember uh, regarding the gelation process. So at this stage, the resin transforms from a liquid where there are no cross links uh, into a rubbery state. At this point, the system will no longer be able to uh, flow. So the viscosity will increase and we'll have two phases in the same system. A gel phase, which is the part of the resin that has been cross-linked and has solidified. And the sol phase, which uh, is the part of the resin that has not been cross-linked and that at this point during the gelation, if we wish so, we can remove it by using uh, solvents. And as I've said before, there is a dramatic increase in terms of uh, the viscosity when we move from this uh, stage of uh, liquid resin into this two-phase uh, stage that we call uh, the gelation. In terms of uh, the vitrification uh, process, so when we move from the gelation phase where we have the sol and the gel into this fully cross-linked three-dimensional network, it's important that we remember that this occurs when the glass transition temperature of the curing resin or the material that we're using increases to the current uh, curing temperature or the temperature at which we are processing uh, the material. However, at the vitrification stage, it's also important that we know that the rate at which the material is cross-linked when compared to the gelation phase is much lower. And this happens because we have less monomers and less photo initiator to actually react. So here at this phase, we have a much higher cross-linking uh, rate, but as we move into the vitrification, the that cross-linking rate uh, decreases. And finally, uh, the physical phase uh, or the final physical phase of this uh, three-dimensional network depends mainly on the temperature uh, that the process is being uh, held, okay? So it's important that you know what happens in terms of uh, the curing reaction of thermostat polymers. Uh, you know also what happens in terms of the gelation and the differences between the gelation and the vitrification phase. And what kind of properties do you obtain in this three-dimensional network depending on the temperature at which you are processing the material? Okay, so this was just some uh, key points that um, I wanted to uh, uh, review again with you and that uh, you should uh, know for um, the next uh, quiz. And now I would like to start um, going a bit more in detail in terms of the injection molding process. We'll be talking about the different types of equipment that we can use. Uh, we're going to be looking at the injection cycle and different phases involved in the processing of materials with injection molding and what are the different process parameters that we can control in order to produce parts without defects using injection molding. And again, and in a very similar manner to uh, metals, uh, we need always to take into account the solidification process of these materials. And in this case, uh, or in the particular case of polymers, what is the effect of the crystallinity on the injection process, okay? And how can we control that 
using uh, the different process parameters. So obviously injection molding is not the only system that we can use to transform uh, raw materials, in this case, plastics into tradable products. There's a wide range of manufacturing techniques that we can use for that purpose. And probably the most used one still nowadays is extrusion. But there are other techniques like um, compression, coating, uh, blowing, but injection molding is gaining um, an increasing relevance in terms of um, polymer processing. And the reason for that is that we can actually um, use injection molding to produce parts made of polymers that are highly accurate. Also, the system itself allows us to control the structures that are formed with uh, the polymers that we're using and in that way control uh, the mechanical properties of the final parts that we are uh, injecting. But probably the most important one is the ability to have a very high throughput rate. So we can produce a large number of parts in uh, a very short period of time. And this is all done in a fully automated way. And that's why uh, many industries, including the automotive uh, industry, has adopted injection molding as probably one of the most important manufacturing technologies to produce components for cars and, and other uh, vehicles. I'm not gonna uh, go too much into detail in terms of the history of injection molding, but I'll just like to bring to your attention, uh, to your attention some of the, of the most important landmarks in terms of the development of this technology. <clears throat> I guess it all started back uh, in the 19th century when uh, Jans Jacob has produced for the first time a condensation uh, polymer, and this was uh, the polyester. There were obviously many important developments throughout history that are uh, important nowadays in terms of the, the technology that is available and also in terms of the materials that are available nowadays to produce uh, parts using plastics. Uh, but probably the second most relevant uh, development uh, was made by the American inventor, James uh, Watson. He was actually the first one to develop and build um, an extrusion uh, injection system that actually contains a screw uh, driven uh, mechanism. And this is probably the most similar uh, system that we have to the ones that are commercially available nowadays. Also, uh, two other important landmarks was uh, one achieved in 1979, where the uh, production of plastic actually overtook the production of uh, steel. And later on in 1990, the use of uh, aluminium molds uh, in terms of injection molding. And obviously <clears throat> nowadays they are used um, very, very widely and they are very common, not just in injection molding, but as we've seen also in metal casting. But in 1990, the introduction of these uh, aluminium molds has actually promoted a big advance in terms of uh, injection molding and in terms of the parts that we could produce with injection molding. And basically, because we could easily uh, manufacture molds at a lower cost when compared to other uh, metals, but also we could have a much better control in terms of the solidification process of the plastics. And as we've seen, having control over the solidification process of materials is extremely relevant in terms of the final properties that we can uh, obtain. And this obviously has promoted the wide adoption of this technology in many industries, probably with the automotive uh, industry uh, at the head of the development in terms of injection molding and the application of injection molding to produce several components uh, for cars from doors, bumpers, uh, hoods, mirrors, uh, you name it. So there is a wide range of products that need to, produce, to be produced at a very large scale. Some of them require a very good uh, geometrical and dimensional uh, accuracy, and also they have very specific requirements in terms of their uh, functionality. And that's, uh, that was actually a, a great step forward in terms of the application of uh, polymers and injection molding in particular in terms of the automotive industry. 
But it's not just in these um, highly specialized industries and high performance uh, components that injection molding has gained an increasing space. Uh, we have examples of application of this technology in polymers uh, over a wide range of products from buckets, uh, but also uh, plastic bottles, Lego uh, parts that I'm sure you all know. Um, they are made with injection molding. And again, here you see the advantage of this technique, the need to produce uh, thousands and thousands of parts uh, that are um, highly precise in terms of their geometry and dimension, uh, but also in terms of the ability of using materials uh, and having different colors, um, having materials that are transparent, and all of that has actually made injection molding and polymers extremely important for a wide range of industries. So probably when you look at this, at this slide, you will see some similarities between the injection molding equipment and what we've seen in metal casting in, 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 in particular in terms of, of die casting. Uh, the, simil the, the similarities are actually uh, valid, uh, but in the case of injection molding, the process is, uh, well, conceptually simple, not as, as simple as it looks, but it's, it's a fairly simple uh, process. So in the process, uh, in the injection molding process, uh, the plastic is uh, melted and then is forced into uh, the cavity of a closed mold which will then give shape to uh, the plastic after sufficient time um, is allowed for this material to uh, solidify, usually by cooling. And after that, after the material is solidified, uh, the mold is open and the part is removed. So in terms of the equipment, uh, the injection molding uh, equipment can be divided normally into three functional uh, units. The first unit is the injection unit that you can see here. It's normally composed of the injection cylinder, the driver unit that normally controls the rotation and the movement of the screw. We also have a hopper that normally contains the plastic material in the form of pellets and that also allows us to control the volume of material that is dispensed into uh, the injection cylinder. And then the barrel that contains the screw and also some heating elements uh, that allows us to control uh, the melting of uh, the material. The second uh, functional unit is the actual mold that will give shape to our uh, parts. And normally the mold has a fixed uh, platen. Uh, this is normally uh, the parts of the mold where you have um, the cavity that will give shape to your uh, part. And then we have another one that is uh, the moving platen. The moving platen is uh, controlled normally by the clamping units, so it moves back and forward. And this allows us to close and open the mold. And uh, most of um, the price uh, or, or, or the size of the injection molding unit is defined by uh, the forces that are required to close the mold. So um, although um, it makes part of the injection uh, molding process, the clamping cylinder or the clamping unit is the part that actually defines the size and also the cost of the machines. I don't have time to show you a video uh, that illustrates the injection molding process, but this video is available on um, the Blackboard page, so please uh, have a look at it because that illustrates all um, the injection uh, phases, but also the different systems and some of the parts that can be produced with uh, injection molding. So as I've, as I've said before, uh, the price of the machine, the size of the machine is normally defined by uh, the parts or the, the dimensions of the part that you are uh, trying to uh, inject. So 
the larger is the parts, obviously the larger is the force that you are required uh, to apply in order to close the mold. And uh, the higher will be this, um, these parts, the more force will be required and therefore uh, a larger clamp clamping force will be required. And um, as a consequence, uh, the bigger will be the machine and obviously the higher will be uh, the cost. So normally the clamping force that you are required to use to, to close the mold is uh, simply uh, defined by the injection pressure that you use to force the material into the cavities of the mold multiplied by the total cavity projected area of your uh, mold. In terms of the injection uh, cycle, this can normally divide it into four stages. The first one is uh, the plastification. And the plastification basically consists of uh, the dosing of uh, the material in the form of pellets, here still in um, a solid state inside the hopper. And once it's dispensed into uh, the injection cylinder, we will use the heating element to melt uh, the material. So at this stage, the only thing that happens is the dosage of the material into the injection cylinder and the melting of this material. The plastification is then followed by the injection. So once the material is uh, melted, what will happen is that the injection cylinder will push the screw forward and the screw will rotate. So as it rotates and moves forward, the material is pushed through the nozzle into the cavity of the mold. Once the material has been forced into the cavity of the mold and starts to solidify, there is another stage called packing or cooling. And this is basically the increase of the pressure that we apply in order to compensate for the volumetric shrinkage that happens uh, during the solidification process of your material. So as your material shrinks, it will leave gaps as we've uh, seen in the previous lectures. And in order to compensate for that contraction of the material, we are required to apply uh, an extra pressure that is normally above of the injection uh, pressure to force more material into the cavity of the mold and compensate for any gaps that are left behind because of the solidification of uh, the process. After this uh, has been done, the screw will uh, return to its original position, the mold will open and we'll have mechanical uh, ejectors that will force the parts out of the mold. And a new cycle uh, then uh, starts. <coughs> so in terms of the injection cycle, it's also important that we understand the properties or the ideal properties of the materials. So the injection normally requires for you to promote the melting of the material, so to transform the solid material into a liquid or a molten state material. And as the screw rotates and moves forward, this material is forced uh, through a, a nozzle into the cavity of the mold. And it's this uh, move of the material from the injection cylinder, where the diameter is much, much larger than the uh, injection nozzle. Uh, because of that move, it's important that the materials that we use display a specific uh, behavior, ideally. And in this case, what we really want is as we increase the shear rate, we want that the shear stresses involved uh, decrease. This will allow the material to be more easily injected uh, to uh, the cavity of the mold, but also to be pushed from the cylinder through the nozzle and finally into the cavity of the mold. 
So ideally what you want is a pseudoplastic material, a material that uh, with increasing shear rate, the level of stress is required to promote its flow or to, in other words, to promote its injection will decrease. And this is quite different from other materials like uh, the Newtonian fluid or uh, a dilatant uh, uh, material, okay? So this is the ideal material for injection uh, molding. Any questions so far? If not, we can um, answer any questions you have towards the end of the lecture. So again, and similar to what happened in metals, uh, it's important that we have uh, into account uh, the crystalline structures that are uh, formed. And in particular, the effect of that crystallinity on uh, the molding process. Crystallinity has uh, a, a significant impact on the injection molding, um, especially in terms of the cooling and the holding pressure um, that we've just seen. And finally, on uh, the parts quality that we produce. In general, uh, high crystalline polymers are characterized by high shrinking uh, values, as uh, we've seen. And Additional changes in terms of the dimensions of the part can also uh, occur after the part has been removed from the mold. And this is caused by uh, continued internal changes in, in the parts due to the crystallization uh, process. So the effect of the crystallinity, and obviously it's, uh, it's obviously important during the solidification process that will happen inside the mold, but it's important that you know that the changes that can occur in terms of the geometry and dimensions of the parts do not happen only inside the mold. They can also happen outside the mold after you remove the parts uh, from the mold. And this can be a problem because some plastics require uh, quite amounts of time to complete the crystallization time. And uh, sometimes for practical reasons, uh, this, this, this part cannot be kept uh, inside the mold until the crystallization process is complete. Okay, and <clears throat> in parts with complex structures, after you remove it from the mold, this can cause uh, warping. So how can we control uh, these different process parameters? How can we control them in order to uh, promote an homogeneous solidification process? Uh, and how can we control in order to avoid uh, these uh, dimensional changes in our parts, but also to avoid any defects that arise from the injection process? So one obviously is uh, the melting temperature. And one important consideration is that the melting temperature is generally below the melting point of uh, the plastic. So in other words, the temperature that you set in the machine, the temperature that you set in the injection cylinder is generally below the melting point of the polymer that you are using. So for example, if you're using a polymer that has a melting point of 100 degrees, you normally set the temperature below that. And the reason why you do that, it's because during the injection process, because of the rotation of the screw, because of the linear movement of the screw, there will be heat being generated. And that we need to take into account that extra heat that is being generated. Uh, and because of that, we normally set the melting temperature below the melting point of the, poly uh, of the polymer. Also, uh, this melting temperature uh, depends quite heavily on uh, the morphology of the polymer. And as we've seen, Polymers with uh, high degrees of crystallinity normally require uh, higher uh, melting uh, temperatures. Also, uh, in terms of the process parameters that we can control, another important one is uh, the temperature of uh, the mold. Normally, the mold temperature is controlled with water that can be circulated through the mold. And some factors that affect the, 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 the temperatures of the system, um, in this case, the melting temperature, uh, but also 
the temperature that you set in the mold. Uh, normally, the shot size, um, or in other words, the volume of material that you are injecting, the rate at which you are injecting that material, so faster injection um, rates or faster filling rates, uh, creates higher melt temperatures because of the shearing effects. The size of the runner of the system is also uh, important. So normally long runners require higher temperatures and this is mainly because we need to ensure that we don't have premature freezing in uh, the channels. The part thickness, it's also uh, important. So thick parts require more cooling time and are generally molded at lower temperatures. So again, it's important that we avoid parts with variable uh, sections. So in terms of the temperature of the, of the mold, it's important that we always take into account these four uh, parameters. The amount of material or the volume of material that we are uh, injecting, the rate at which we are doing the injection of this uh, material, and the long or the size of uh, the runners that the material will have to go through in order to fill in the mold cavity. And as much as possible, it's important that we avoid changes in terms of uh, the wall thickness of our parts to ensure an homogeneous uh, filling and solidification process of the material. So <coughs> it is important to control uh, the temperature in uh, the mold. And a way of controlling that is by creating these channels that we can then circulate with uh, water. And what this will do is to help either cooling down or heating up uh, the mold. And in this way, allowing us to extract more heat, so in, uh, increasing the, the, the solidification rate, or to increase uh, the heat or the temperature inside our mold cavity to ensure that we have a complete filling of our parts. So these channels, can have different uh, shapes. So conventional molds normally have these straight uh, line cooling uh, channels. However, and despite being uh, widely used, they present uh, some uh, problems in terms of the solidification process and the way that we can uh, control the solidification of parts, especially parts with very complex uh, geometries. And one of the problems is that uh, we cannot uh, extract heat from the parts in an homogeneous way. So a way to overcome that is to generate conformal cooling channels. So conformal cooling makes use of cooling lines in uh, an injection mold that curve and closely follow the geometry of the parts that you want to produce. And in this way, we can enhance the cooling process of the parts and reduce the injection uh, cycle. Again, I'm not gonna have time to show you uh, the video with um, the design and manufacturing of these cooling channels, but normally these cooling channels, because of their geometries, they are normally made with um, additive uh, manufacturing. And by having these channels that closely follow the geometry of the parts, we can more effectively extract heat or provide heat to the part. And in this way, we can uh, reduce the injection cycle of our polymers and therefore increase the productivity using uh, injection uh, molding. Another important parameter is the injection pressure or uh, the holding pressure. So the injection and holding should be done uh, at the lowest practical pressures possible uh, without resulting in short uh, shots. So as I've said in the previous slide, this uh, holding pressure is the pressure that we apply above the injection pressure in order to ensure 
that we will provide extra material to compensate for uh, the volumetric shrinkage that happens during the solidification process of uh, your parts. So the pressure should always should also uh, be high enough and maintained during enough time to obviously minimize the shrinkage uh, by providing more material uh, in the in the in the in the liquid state into the mold that we normally call the packing process. Uh, and this should be applied during the time that the pass is shrinking or cooling. So always inside the molds and before you open the molds and retrieve the pass. So important concepts about the injection pressure and holding pressure. The injection pressure is normally lower than the holding pressure. Both of them should be uh, used or set at uh, the lowest levels uh, possible without compromising the injection of uh, your parts. And you should maintain the holding pressure enough time to ensure that you will uh, fill in completely uh, the mold cavity, including the gaps that are left uh, behind because of the shrinkage of uh, your polymer. In terms of the process parameters, uh, the injection time uh, is a time uh, to actually force the molten metal into uh, the cavity of the mold. And this time is, uh, as you can easily imagine, controlled by uh, the injection uh, rate. So the, the, the rate at which you are filling in your uh, mold. The dwell time, uh, as it's stated here, is a time uh, that the force of pressure is applied to the cavity after the cavity is filled. So basically is the time during which you are applying this extra pressure that we call hold pressure to compensate for the shrinkage. The freeze time or the cooling time is uh, the interval of time um, after this pressure is relieved. So when the screw returns to its original position and just before the mold is open and the ejectors force the solidified part to be ejected from uh, your uh, part. Just uh, another important aspect is that the temperature of the mold is normally set to be below the solidification points of the material. So because of that, Long injection, injection times will uh, likely increase the probability of generating uh, uh, short shots. Or uh, in other words, if you have uh, a long injection time, it's very likely they have some premature freezing in the runners or in the channels. Also in parts with thick sections or with very small gates into the cavity of the mold, the injection rate is sometimes lower so that you can ensure a continual passage of molten metal through the gates to prevent freezing and to allow the parts to be uh, completely filled uh, in. Also, parts with uh, only thin sections, these are normally filled at very high injection rates. And the reason why we do this is to prevent um, solidification of the parts before it completes um, its uh, filling process. Finally, um, the ejection time is, is basically the time uh, that counts between, um, or that is normally required to open the molds, to activate the ejectors and to force the parts to be ejected from the cavity of the mold and for the mold to close uh, again. So these are just some uh, definitions of different parameters that are associated with uh, the injection molding process. Okay, it is important that you know them. It is important that you know what is the effect of controlling these process parameters in terms of, um, for example, avoiding defects uh, related to injection molding, but also how can they be effectively used to control the solidification process of uh, uh, injection uh, molded parts. So just to summarize, in injection molding, uh, we normally have a solid uh, plastic. This is melted 
inside the injection cylinder. Once it's melted, the screw will start to rotate and have this linear displacement that will force this molten metal through the nozzle into uh, the cavity of the, of the mold, where it will solidify. And the solidification process can be controlled by using um, channels that uh, are normally filled in with water, but there are other uh, systems that contain, for example, gas. And these systems should normally have um, a geometry that closely follow uh, the parts. And this allows us to have a better control over the solidification process. And these channels are called conformal cooling channels. Also, there are several parameters that we can control in injection molding. Uh, injection pressure and holding pressure, they are very different. Holding pressure is normally much higher than the injection pressure. And this is the amount of pressure that we apply to force extra material to be injected into the mold cavity to compensate for the volumetric shrinkage that happens during the solidification of your parts. The injection or fill rates and time and normally the time required to inject uh, the required amount of material into uh, the mold. The dwell time is related with the amount of time that you are applying this holding pressure. And the freezing time, cooling time and injection times are related with the time required to solidify the material and the time to open and close the mold and to restart uh, the cycle. So this brings us to the end of our lecture and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have on this.